Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 481, A Brooch Breach. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. I hope you are not buried under a foot and a half of snow like we are. Happy spring. I, I hope you're having a spring if you're in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it's been interesting. And amazingly we have used up all of our snow days the school had moved the graduation until the friday right before the craftlet scotland tour departure it was very tense very stressful because my son thing one will be accompanying me as my my partner in crime in scotland and it was looking like if we had one more snow day we were going to wind up having to figure out how to get him to Scotland after graduation, and I would miss his graduation. But because our superintendent is awesome, he decided that graduation would not be moved. Too many people had made plans. Grandparents were coming in from out of town. So we got a reprieve. My son will be able to graduate and accompany me on the tour. And I am so excited for those of you who are joining us in Scotland. He's, he's turned into a remarkable young man. And especially if you've been listening to the show for a long time or caught up over the last gazillion years that I've been doing this, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I hope you'll be pleasantly surprised. On other fronts, I do have actual news. You may remember the name Yarnyanta. Heatherly Walker has been a, a longtime listener to the show and an excellent knitter, and she's all over Ravelry. And I missed the fact that she has a book. She has a book out. It's called Unobtainables, Fake Elements, Real Knits. And she wrote it with Alison Sarnoff. It is really, really fun. It's a very nerdy knit book. I have a direct link to it from the show notes at craftlit.com slash 483. And take a look and tell me that you don't want to just revel in the glory that is this particular book. I'm so excited. So congratulations, Heather Lee. Way to go. And I got a note from Robin. Robin is a teacher and longtime listener in Colorado. And Robin had some really interesting points to make about the walk up thing instead of the walk out thing that some students did last week on the month anniversary of the Parkland shooting. She said there, there is another side to the walk up concept. And she said, don't get me wrong, I'm all for combating bullying. But the idea that it is the bullied victims that become school shooters is actually wrong. In most cases of child-on-child -child violence, it's the bully that kills their classmates. And that is generally true for the young school shooters as well, even in Columbine. And she links out to an article about Eric Harris and also links to a, a direct rebuttal to the whole walk-up concept, which I thought was really, really fascinating and well-written. And then found a link to kind of a, a personal testimonial of what it was like to be a kid who was walked up to as kind of a, a quiet, nerdy kid. Really, probably very important. If you are a, a parent or grandparent of a child who is anywhere in school, I think it's probably really important to read these three links from Robin. I thought they were fascinating. And she said, regardless of all of that, the Choose Kindness movement, this is connected to the book and now the movie Wonder, uh, she said is, is probably much better when trying to uh, help heal the whole problem of bullying. So I thought that was great and very useful. Thank you, Robin. So building on what Robin had to say is a voicemail from Tara, which I think, number one, puts it into sharp relief. And number two is almost identical to the post that Robin mentioned about the, the perspective of someone who was walked up to. And since you know Tara by voice and by good humor and by exuberance. 
I thought it was probably really important for everyone to hear what she had to say. Here we go. Hi, Heather. It's Tara. I have a couple of comments. The first comment is about how none of the girls walked up to Anne at Sunday school. I, growing up in a small town, had a similar thing happen to me. I was born out of wedlock and in a very small town where there are only three churches I was the bastard child of two perfectly good families who are now ruined because the two oldest kids wouldn't get married and because the son of one refused to acknowledge my existence now granted this really didn't bother me until high school and this is where my second comment comes in you mentioned the walk up that was happening instead of uh, instead of walking out. Whilst, yes, the walk up when done by the appropriately acting, understanding high schoolers works. It works like a dream. It is an amazing thing to see happen and to be a part of. But when it is the jerk kids who walk up to you and go, you're not going to shoot me, right? Because I hardly bullied you. This is where I I balk. It's like shoving dirt in my mouth. Yes, it works for the kids who know what they're saying and how to say it. But it does not work when it comes to the bullies who pick on the odd children like I was. Case in point, in high school, in the yearbooks, oh, cutest couple, most unique. You know what I was voting in as a vote for? Most likely to call him by the school. Now, granted, it was never put in the yearbook because that sends the wrong message about our student body and how we view our fellow students. And yes, understandably, I was the angry child. I was the kid who sat in the back of the class drawing nude figure study in math because using the math ratios to draw golden ratio proportions was my jam. That was my thing. I loved it. I became the person who would strong shoulder through the hallways walking to classes and who at some point in time managed to learn that look where you would say something to the person and they would slowly look up from what they were doing and you could watch their soul melt with how you looked at them. Understandably, yes, my actions didn't help change the opinion much of any of the kids who didn't really know me. But the ones who did knew me. They knew how funny and how kind and how compassionate and how much of a good human being I could be if I was merely decent to. People who meet me now don't know this about me. Like, I will, ha, 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 oh, you were voted that. I was most likely to call him by my school. Yeah, pretty funny, isn't it? And they were like, oh, that's, you don't seem like that kind of person. Well, no, because I don't have to be that person anymore. I can be genuine and not guarded and probably jaded by the experiences of my youth in my hometown. Those are my views that I bring to this book from my life. And I kind of feel like I wouldn't have been such a burr under the horse blanket as I was had I read Anne of Green Gables as a child instead of Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House on the Prairie in the Big Woods. Seeing how much good Anne sees in the world outside of people, but mostly the places and atmosphere she's raised in, I feel that I would probably be have been a different person if I had had that sort of inspirational outlet for a lot of my feelings. But All things aside, I am thoroughly enjoying the book while I do dishes and burn rice for dinner, and I really can't wait to hear the next chapter. I hope you're having a great day, Heather, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. So yeah, that kind of squares it out. And it's so interesting because as I was reading the original article that was sent out to us, which, by the way, our school didn't wind up doing. They did something else entirely, which I thought was lovely. It hadn't occurred to me that the jerk kids would even participate, but 
of course, it would just be another opportunity to feel better than someone else. And for whatever reason, I'm sure plenty of kids would take advantage of that opportunity. And of course, there's the problem that kids don't say things like that in front of other adults. They're usually smart enough to know better, which is, I don't know, maybe even worse in some ways. But I really wanted to thank Robin and Tara for sending in the other side so that everybody gets to hear it, because I'm sure you are not alone in your responses. So as always, thank you for calling in, for writing in, and for letting everybody know your thoughts. And then I also got an email from Anna G. Anna G sent some really interesting links on wet nursing. And then she said, I started to research it in January when my baby was born and found this particular JSTOR article particularly intriguing. According to what I've read, wet nursing has been doctor recommended for years, even in the mid and late 1800s and early 1900s, until formula was more effective. In fact, it seems that many babies fed the formula at the time when it was first invented, died of malnutrition. Uh, my great-grandmother spoke of people giving their babies watery cereal sucked through a rag when they couldn't feed them milk, which, as soon as I read that, I thought, I have heard that, I do remember that. And then she said they would also give them a sugar tit, a rag with sugar twisted up like a pacifier. And she also wanted to mention that perhaps Ellen Montgomery was giving a little throwback to Dickens, because remember how Mrs. Joe from Great Expectations brought up Pip by hand. And the quote is, my sister, Mrs. Joe Gargery, was more than 20 years older than I and had established a great reputation with herself and the neighbors because she had brought me up by hand. I am sure that Lucy Montgomery was building on that concept, and that tells us a lot about what she means also. I wanted to add one thing to the whole sugar tit idea. Back when Thing One was a small little burrito <laughs> is swaddling, he had really, really bad acid reflux, and I, it took a while to figure out what was going on. But by the time he was three months old, he was still having trouble. We had a really wonderful babysitter who was able to come to his bar mitzvah, which was just awesome. She kept wanting to give him sugar water. Now, she's Jamaican. She kept wanting to give him sugar water, and I kept thinking, wow, giving a child sugar, that's such a bad idea. I don't want my kid to be hooked on sugar from birth. You know, this is a bad thing. It's refined sugar. Finally, I came home one day and she had found what they called baby water in the store in her neighborhood. And she brought some and I started buying it pretty regularly because it had a very small dose of sugar in it. And shortly after that, after all of my having and hawing and thinking, oh, this is crazy. Um, yeah, not so much crazy because I read an article on how sugar acts as an analgesic on little humans, like under the age of two little humans. So it's like giving the kid Tylenol. It settles their stomach. It's, it's kind of like having ginger ale when your stomach is upset. I had no idea. So the, the whole idea of giving babies a little sugar pacifier to suck on is not that crazy. So thank you, Anna, for sending that in. All right, so we have some interesting chapters today from... Anne of Green Cables. And Kim, bless her heart, right before she had to take off on a trip, she recorded three chapters for us. So first off on things to know in advance, consumption, movie wasting disease. This is usually in real life tuberculosis, but it is Camille-like, the classic uh, romantic, capital R, romantic heroine's choice of mode of death. <laughs> in any of those novels, you know, back of hand to the forehead, <laughs> into the handkerchief, the whole bit. So just remember consumption. You should know in advance that Lucy Maud Montgomery was mad about gardens, and very specifically, mad about cottage gardens. English cottage gardens are a particular kind that look accidentally gorgeous or naturally beautiful to the point where someone who was a really, really good cottage gardener, and this is according to Lucy Maud Montgomery's journals, so this would be her neck of the woods, it was somebody who found a way to seamlessly transition between grass and into flowers. So kind of carefully planning the height of the flowers so that they would gradually build up to the taller and taller 
blooms, which is really cool, I think. So you're going to hear a whole ton of gardening and flower ring information in our first chapter today. And it's not on accident. Those are Lucy Maud Montgomery's favorites. A sewing machine agent. Sewing machine agents were door-to-door salesmen who would travel around selling sewing machines. And they often, very cleverly, if the, the woman of the house didn't want to buy a sewing machine right then, they would leave a photograph or a, a color print, not a photograph, like a, a, like a one sheet, like an advertisement. Except instead of it saying, come to Best Buy and grab yourself this fabulous machine, instead it would be a painting, a reproduction of a painting of a woman in a lovely dress and a properly domestic scene, resting her hand gently and gracefully on the top of her new sewing machine. (laughs) This was the way they were advertising. It was brilliant. You are going to hear reference to a picture that was left by a sewing machine agent, and that's what it was. Patchwork. Patchwork quilting. So when somebody said get your patchwork, they meant get your scraps for scrap quilting. And I looked this up to see if there was anything in particular that was going on in Prince Edward Island-ish areas during this time. And what I found had nothing to do with Prince Edward Island and 1908. But in 1864... When the provinces of Canada got together and decided to become a confederation of states, a woman named Fanny Parley made dresses for the wives of these guys to wear to a confederation ball. She kept scraps of their dresses, of the the material that she used to make their dresses, and then she made a crazy quilt out of them. And I've linked out to a video that shows the whole shebang. It's beautiful. And they do some really nice photography on the video of close-ups of the incredible fabrics. And boy, I mean, aside from a few of them where the nap is really worn down, the silks and the taffetas and the velvets, you can still see the detail. It has been in, been really well preserved and it's beautiful. So that's one thing. But then I also found some examples and I've linked out to photographs of some scrappy quilts. One of them has one-by-one-inch squares, and some of them look like they might be English paper piecing or have been done using that technique, Uh, some of them not so much. But either way, people separated their scrap piles into general sizes and then cut their squares or rectangles or hexagons out of, or diamonds, uh, out of those scrap piles to create uniform sizes. And of course, they had to do it all with scissors because they didn't have rotary cutters and that is just amazing to me. But there are some lovely examples, and they're, they're really beautiful. So that's what patchwork is. There is a line from Alexander Pope. He called it the ninth beatitude. Jesus had eight. Alexander Pope felt <laughs> inspired to write a ninth. And it is, Blessed is the man who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. <laughs> so Anne doesn't quite get that it's a joke. But that's okay, too, because it makes it even funnier in context for us. So that's pretty cool. Also, you should note that amethysts are found in Nova Scotia. In fact, there's a whole rock hunting world out there that has to do with the, the area in and around Nova Scotia. And I've linked out to a page on that as well at craftlet.com 483 in case you're interested in going rock hunting. In chapter 14, our last chapter for the day, Anne is going to use a phrase, the viewless winds. And this actually comes from measure for measure. So it makes me think that there were some pretty interesting chunks of Shakespeare that were put into the primers, the the readers that Anne was using at school, because this comes from Claudio's speech. And you may recall over on Chop Bard, Aaron Ziegler did a beautiful job of talking about how relationships, power relationships between men and women hadn't changed a whole lot in 400 years. And this is actually from that conversation when the sister is trying to convince her brother that marrying her off when she was planning to become a nun, marrying her off to this horrible, horrible prince is a really not such a great thing to ask her to do. And that would mean that he would have to die to be executed. So in part of the argument, he says, I but to die and go we know not where to lie in cold obstruction and to rot, 
this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod, and the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods or to reside in thrilling region of thick-ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round the pendant world, and he goes on from there, clearly referring to Dante's Inferno, but also that beautiful line to be imprisoned in the viewless winds. That's the line that Anne is going to utilize in part of her talking in chapter 14. Only three more things. Bread sponge. If you were making bread and you wanted it to be particularly tasty back in the day, like a, a brioche or a, a stollen, you might use something called a sponge where you make a wet blob of almost completely made dough and you let that sit there for a little while and ferment, much like you would do with the steps for making really good sourdough. This doesn't necessarily get it to the same sourness that a, a proper sourdough construction would take, but it does get you some flavorful elements added in because fermenting a blob like this, the sponge, would help make the bread tastier because of the fermentation. It would aid with the texture of the bread, and part of that is because of the chemistry. It would actually give time for enzymes to start to break down some of the on the molecular level, harder parts of the, the wheat flour that you're going to use. So it would be able to, to soften some of the gluten and add to the stretchiness and structure of the bread dough when you finally mix that, that starter, that sponge, into the rest of the flour in order to be able to knead it and make it rise and all of that stuff. So it's partially fermenting because that means that you're adding natural yeast to it, but it's also fermenting to improve the taste and texture. There's a word rigmarole or rigmarole, which comes from, and I found this on many, many locations written differently, which means it's not just people copying and pasting this explanation. Back in the day, Edward I, the Hammer of the Scots, forced Scottish nobility to swear fealty to him. The parchments upon which these men wrote their fealty down and signed their name to it, those became known as ragman rolls. Now, nobody really knows why Ragman. There are several theories about where the word might have come from. Coward in Sweden, I think, is one of the theories. There are several others. But the important part is that it, it became known as, these Ragman rules became known as a laundry list of offenses or things that you had done that you're not going to do anymore. And so going through the whole rigmarole was going through something rather tedious and kind of a trial, and you really wish it would just be shorter and easier to get through. And that's where the term comes from. So there, I had no idea. And the last one, super easy, a stocking basket is the socks that you're going to mend. So you'd pick up your stocking basket at night and fix those suckers up. So pretty cool. All right, you are now fully prepared for chapters 12, 13, and 14 of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery read for us by Kim Zuckert. Here we go. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Read by Kim Zuckert. Chapter 12, A Solemn Vow and Promise. It was not until the next Friday that Marilla heard the story of the flower-wreathed hat she came home from Mrs. Lynde's and called Anne to account. Anne, Mrs. Rachel said you went to church last Sunday with your hat, rigged out ridiculous with roses and buttercups. What on earth put you up to such a caper? A pretty-looking object you must have been. Oh, I know pink and yellow aren't becoming to me, began Anne. Becoming fiddlesticks! It was putting flowers on your hat at all, no matter what color they were, that was ridiculous. You are the most aggravating child. I don't see why it's any more ridiculous to wear flowers on your hat than on your dress, protested Anne. Lots of little girls there had bouquets pinned on their dresses. What's the difference? Marilla was not to be drawn from the safe concrete into dubious paths of the abstract. Don't answer me back like that, Anne. It was very silly of you to do such a thing. Never let me catch you at such a trick again. Mrs. Rachel said she thought she would sink through the floor when she saw you come in all rigged out like that. She couldn't get near enough to tell you to take them off until it was too late. 
She says people talked about it something dreadful. Of course, they would think I had no better sense than to let you go decked out like that. Oh, I'm so sorry, said Anne, tears welling into her eyes. I never thought you'd mind. The roses and buttercups were so sweet and pretty, I thought they'd look lovely on my hat. Lots of the little girls had artificial flowers on their hats. I'm afraid I'm going to be a dreadful trial to you. Maybe you'd better send me back to the asylum. That would be terrible. I don't think I could endure it. Most likely I would go into consumption. I'm so thin as it is, you see. But that would be better than being a trial to you. Nonsense, said Marilla, vexed at herself for having made the child cry. I don't want to send you back to the asylum, I'm sure. All I want is that you should behave like other little girls and not make yourself ridiculous. Don't cry any more. I've got some news for you. Diana Barry came home this afternoon. I'm going up to see if I can borrow a skirt pattern from Mrs. Barry, and if you like, you can come with me and get acquainted with Diana. Anne rose to her feet with clasped hands, the tears still glistening on her cheeks. The dish towel she had been hemming slipped unheeded to the floor. Oh, Marilla, I'm frightened. Now that it has come, I'm actually frightened. What if she shouldn't like me? It would be the most tragical disappointment of my life. Now don't get into a fluster, and I do wish you wouldn't use such long words. It sounds so funny in a little girl. I guess Diana will like you well enough. It's her mother you've got to reckon with. If she doesn't like you, it won't matter how much Diana does. If she has heard about your outburst to Mrs. Lynde and going to church with buttercups round your hat, I don't know what she'll think of you. You must be polite and well-behaved and don't make any of your startling speeches. For pity's sake, if the child isn't actually trembling. Anne was trembling. Her face was pale and tense. Oh, Marilla, you'd be excited, too, if, if you were going to meet a little girl you hoped to be your bosom friend and whose mother mightn't like you, she said, as she hastened to get her hat. They went over to Orchard Slope, by the shortcut across the brook and up the furry hill grove. Mrs. Barry came to the kitchen door in answer to Marilla's knock. She was a tall, black-eyed, black-haired woman with a very resolute mouth. She had the reputation of being very strict with her children. "'How do you do, Marilla?' she said cordially. "'Come in. And this is the little girl you've adopted, I suppose.' "'Yes, this is Anne Shirley,' said Marilla. S "'Spelled with an E?' gasped Anne, who, tremulous and excited as she was, was determined there should be no misunderstanding on that important point. Mrs. Barry, not hearing or not comprehending, merely shook hands and said kindly, "'How are you?' "'I'm well in body, although considerably rumpled up in spirit. Thank you, ma'am,' said Anne gravely, then aside to Marilla in an audible whisper. "'There wasn't anything startling in that, was there, Marilla?' Diana was sitting on the sofa, reading a book which she dropped when the callers entered. She was a very pretty little girl, with her mother's black eyes and hair, and rosy cheeks, and the merry expression which was her inheritance from her father. "'This is my little girl, Diana.' said Mrs. Barry. Diana, you may take Anne out into the garden and show her your flowers. It will be better for you than straining your eyes over that book. She reads entirely too much, this to Marilla as the little girls went out, and I can't prevent her, for her father aids and abets her. She's always poring over a book. I'm glad she has the prospect of a playmate. Perhaps it will take her more out of doors. Outside in the garden, which was full of Mellow sunset light streaming through the dark old firs to the west of it stood Anne and Diana, gazing bashfully at each other over a clump of gorgeous tiger lilies. The Barry Garden was a bowery wilderness of flowers, which would have delighted Anne's heart at any time less fraught with destiny. It was encircled by huge old willows and tall firs, beneath which flourished flowers that loved the shade. Prim, right-angled paths, neatly bordered with clamshells, intersected it like moist red ribbons, and in the beds between, old-fashioned flowers ran riot. There were rosy, bleeding hearts, and great, splendid crimson peonies, white, fragrant narcissi, and thorny, sweet scotch roses, pink and blue and white columbines, and lilac-tinted bouncing bets, clumps of southern wood, and ribbon grass, and mint, purple Adam and Eve, daffodils, and masses of sweet clover, white with its delicate, fragrant, feathery sprays, 
scarlet lightning that shot its fiery lances over prim white musk flowers. A garden it was, where sunshine lingered and bees hummed, and winds, beguiled into loitering, purred and rustled. "'Oh, Diana,' said Anne at last, clasping her hands and speaking almost in a whisper, "'oh, do you think you can like me a little, enough to be my bosom friend?' Diana laughed. Diana always laughed before she spoke. <laughs> "'Why, I guess so,' she said frankly. "'I'm awfully glad you've come to live at Green Gables. "'It will be jolly to have somebody to play with. "'There isn't any other girl who lives near enough to play with, "'and I'm no sisters big enough.' "'Will you swear to be my friend forever and ever?' demanded Anne eagerly. Diana looked shocked. "'Why, it's dreadfully wicked to swear,' she said rebukingly. "'Oh, no, not my kind of swearing. There are two kinds, you know.' "'I've never heard of but one kind,' said Diana doubtfully. "'There really is another. Oh, it isn't wicked at all. It just means vowing and promising solemnly.' "'Oh, well, I don't mind doing that,' agreed Diana, relieved. "'How do you do it?' "'We must join hands. So,' said Anne gravely. "'It ought to be over running water. "'We'll just imagine this path is running water. "'I'll repeat the oath first. "'I solemnly swear to be faithful to my bosom friend, Diana Barry, "'for as long as the sun and moon shall endure. "'Now you say it, and put my name in.' "'Diana repeated the oath with a laugh fore and aft. "'Then she said, "'You're a queer girl, Anne. "'I heard before that you were queer, "'but I believe I'm going to like you real well.' When Marilla and Anne went home, Diana went with them as far as the log bridge. The two little girls walked with their arms about each other. At the brook, they parted with many promises to spend the next afternoon together. "'Well, did you find Diana a kindred spirit?' asked Marilla, as they went up through the Garden of Green Gables. "'Oh, yes!' sighed Anne, blissfully unconscious of any sarcasm on Marilla's part. "'Oh, Marilla, I'm the happiest girl on Prince Edward Island this very moment. "'I assure you I'll say my prayers with a right good will tonight. "'Diana and I are going to build a playhouse in Mr. William Bell's birch grove tomorrow. "'Can I have those broken pieces of china that are out in the woodshed? "'Diana's birthday is in February, and mine is in March. "'Don't you think that is a very strange coincidence? "'Diana's going to lend me a book to read. "'She says it's perfectly splendid and tremendously exciting. "'She's going to show me a place back in the woods where rice lilies grow.' "'Don't you think Diana's got very soulful eyes? "'I wish I had soulful eyes. "'Diana's going to teach me to sing a song called Nellie in the Hazel Dell. "'She's going to give me a picture to put up in my room. "'It's a perfectly beautiful picture,' she says. "'A lovely lady in a pale blue silk dress. "'A sewing machine agent gave it to her. "'I wish I had something to give Diana. "'I'm an inch taller than Diana, but she is ever so much fatter. "'She said she'd like to be thin because it's so much more graceful, "'but I'm afraid she only said that to soothe my feelings.' "'We're going to the shore some day to gather shells. "'We have agreed to call the spring down by the log bridge the Dryad's Bubble. "'Isn't that a perfectly elegant name? "'I read a story once about a spring called that. "'A dryad is a, a sort of a grown-up fairy, I think.' "'Well, all I hope is you won't talk Diana to death,' said Marilla. "'But remember this in all your planning, Anne. "'You're not going to play all the time, nor most of it. "'You'll have your work to do, and it'll have to be done first. "'Anne's cup of happiness was full.' and Matthew caused it to overflow. He had just got home from a trip to the store at Carmody, and he sheepishly produced a small parcel from his pocket and handed it to Anne with a deprecatory look at Marilla. "'I heard you say you like chocolate sweeties, so I got you some,' he said. "Hm," sniffed Marilla. "'It'll ruin her teeth and stomach.' "'Oh, there, there, child. Don't look so dismal. You can eat those, since Matthew has gone and got them. He'd better have brought you peppermints. They're wholesomer.' "'Don't sicken yourself eating them all at once now.' "'Oh, no, indeed I won't,' said Anne eagerly. "'I'll just eat one tonight, Marilla, and I can give Diana half of them, can't I? "'The other half will taste twice as sweet to me if I can give some to her. "'It's delightful to think I have something to give her.' "'I will say it for the child,' said Marilla, when Anne had gone to her gable. "'She isn't stingy. I'm glad, for all faults, I detest stinginess in a child.' "'Dear me, it's only three weeks since she came, "'and it seems as if she'd been here always. "'I can't imagine the place without her.' 
Now don't be looking I told you so, Matthew. That's bad enough in a woman, but it isn't to be endured in a man. I'm perfectly willing to own up that I'm glad I consented to keep the child, and that I'm getting fond of her. But don't you rub it in, Matthew Cuthbert. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 The Delights of Anticipation "'It's time Anne was in to do her sewing,' said Marilla, glancing at the clock, and then out into the yellow August afternoon where everything drowsed in the heat. "'She stayed playing with Diana more than half an hour more than I gave her leave to, and now she's perched out there on the woodpile talking to Matthew, nineteen to the dozen, when she knows perfectly well she ought to be at her work. And of course he's listening to her like a perfect ninny. I never saw such an infatuated man. The more she talks and the odder things she says, the more he's delighted, evidently. And Shirley, you come right in here this minute. Do you hear me? A series of staccato taps on the west window brought Anne flying in from the yard, eyes shining, cheeks faintly flushed with pink, unbraided hair streaming behind her in a torrent of brightness. Oh, Marilla, she exclaimed breathlessly, there's going to be a Sunday school picnic next week in Mr. Harmon Andrews' field, right near the Lake of Shining Waters, and Mrs. Superintendent Bell and Mrs. Rachel Lynde are going to make ice cream. Think of it, Marilla, ice cream! And oh, Marilla, can I go to it? Just look at the clock, if you please, Anne. What time did I tell you to come in? Two o'clock. But isn't it splendid about the picnic, Marilla? Please, can I go? Oh, I've never been to a picnic. I've dreamed of picnics, but I've never... Yes, I told you to come at two o'clock, and it's a quarter to three. I'd like to know why you didn't obey me, Anne. Why, I meant to, Marilla, as much as could be. But you've no idea how fascinating Idlewild is. And then, of course, I had to tell Matthew about the picnic. Matthew is such a sympathetic listener. Please, can I go? You'll have to learn to resist the fascination of idle whatever you call it. When I tell you to come in at a certain time, I mean that time and not half an hour later. And you needn't stop to discourse with sympathetic listeners on your way, either. As for the picnic, of course you can go. You're a Sunday school scholar, and it's not likely I'd refuse to let you when all the other little girls are going. But, but, faltered Anne, Diana says that everybody must take a basket of things to eat. I can't cook, as you know, Marilla, and and I don't mind going to a picnic without puff sleeve so much, but I'd feel terribly humiliated if I had to go without a basket. It's been preying on my mind ever since Diana told me. Well, it needn't pray any longer. I'll bake you a basket. Oh, you dear good Marilla. Oh, you are so kind to me. Oh, I'm so much obliged to you. Getting through with her O's. Anne cast herself into Marilla's arms and rapturously kissed her sallow cheek. It was the first time in her whole life the childish lips had voluntarily touched Marilla's face. Again that sudden sensation of startling sweetness thrilled her. She was secretly vastly pleased at Anne's impulsive caress, which was probably the reason why she said brusquely, "'There, there, never mind your kissing nonsense. I'd sooner see you doing strictly as you're told.' As for cooking, I mean to begin giving you lessons in that some of these days, but you're so feather-brained, Anne. I've been waiting to see if you'd sober down a little and learn to be steady before I begin. You've got to keep your wits about you in cooking and not stop in the middle of things to let your thoughts rove all over creation. Now, get out your patchwork and have your square done before tea time. I do not like patchwork, said Anne dolefully hunting out her work-basket and sitting down before a little heap of red and white diamonds with a sigh. I think some kinds of sewing would be nice, but there's no scope for imagination in patchwork. It's just one little seam after another, and you never seem to be getting anywhere. But, of course, I'd rather be Anne of Green Gables sewing patchwork than Anne of any other place with nothing to do but play. I wish time went as quick sewing patches as it does when I'm playing with Diana, though. Oh, we do have such elegant times, Marilla. I have to furnish most of the imagination, but I'm well able to do that. Diana is simply perfect in every other way. You know that little piece of land across the brook that runs up between our farm and Mr. Barry's? It belongs to Mr. William Bell, and right in that corner there's a little ring of white birch trees, the most romantic spot, Marilla. Diana and I have our playhouse there. We call it Idlewild. Isn't that a poetical name? I assure you it took me some time to think it out. I stayed awake nearly a whole night before I invented it. Then, just as I was dropping off to sleep, it came like an inspiration. Diana was enraptured when she heard it. We've got our house fixed up elegantly. 
You must come and see it, Marilla, won't you? We have great big stones, all covered with moss for seats, and boards from tree to tree for shelves. And we have all our dishes on them. Of course, they're all broken, but it's the easiest thing in the world to imagine that they're whole. There's a piece of plate with a spray of red and yellow ivy that is especially beautiful. We keep it in the parlor, and we have the fairy glass there, too. The fairy glass is as lovely as a dream. Diana found it out in the woods behind their chicken house. It's all full of rainbows, just little young rainbows that haven't grown big yet. And Diana's mother told her it was broken off a hanging lamp they once had. But it's nice to imagine the fairies lost it one night when they had a ball, so we call it the fairy glass. Matthew's going to make us a table. Oh, we've named that little round pool over in Mr. Barry's field Willowmere. I got that name out of a book Diana lent me. That was a thrilling book, Marilla. The heroine had five lovers. I'd be satisfied with one, wouldn't you? She was very handsome and went through great tribulations. She could faint as easy as anything. Oh, I'd love to be able to faint, wouldn't you, Marilla? It's so romantic. But I'm really very healthy for all I'm so thin. I believe I'm getting fatter, though. Don't you think I am? I look at my elbows every morning when I get up to see if any dimples are coming. Diana is having a new dress made with elbow sleeves. She's going to wear it to the picnic. Oh, I do hope it'll be fine next Wednesday. I don't feel that I could endure the disappointment if anything happened to prevent me from getting to the picnic. I suppose I'd live through it, but I'm certain it would be a lifelong sorrow. It wouldn't matter if I got to a hundred picnics in after years. They wouldn't make up for missing this one. They're going to have boats on the Lake of Shining Waters and ice cream, as I told you. I've never tasted ice cream. Diana tried to explain what it was like, but I guess ice cream is one of those things that are beyond imagination. And you've talked even on for ten minutes by the clock, said Marilla. Now, just for curiosity's sake, see if you can hold your tongue for the same length of time. Anne held her tongue as desired, but for the rest of the week she talked picnic and thought picnic and dreamed picnic. On Saturday it rained, and she worked herself up into such a frantic state lest it should keep on raining until an over Wednesday that Marilla made her sew an extra patchwork square by way of steadying her nerves. On Sunday Anne confided to Marilla on the way home from church that she grew actually cold all over with excitement when the minister announced the picnic from the pulpit. Such a thrill as went up and down my back, Marilla. I don't think I'd ever really believed until then that there was honestly going to be a picnic. I couldn't help fearing I'd only imagined it. But when a minister says a thing in the pulpit, you just have to believe it. You set your heart too much on things, Anne, said Marilla with a sigh. I'm afraid there'll be a great many disappointments in store for you through life. Oh, Marilla, looking forward to things is half the pleasure in them exclaimed Anne. You mayn't get the things themselves, but nothing can prevent you from having the fun of looking forward to them. Mrs. Lynde said, Blessed are they who expect nothing, for they shall not be disappointed, but I think it would be worse to expect nothing than to be disappointed. Marilla wore her amethyst brooch to church that day as usual. Marilla always wore her amethyst brooch to church. She would have thought it rather sacrilegious to leave it off, as bad as forgetting her Bible or her collection dime. That amethyst brooch was Marilla's most treasured possession. A seafaring uncle had given it to her mother, who in turn had bequeathed it to Marilla. It was an old-fashioned oval, containing a braid of her mother's hair, surrounded by a border of very fine amethysts. Marilla knew too little about precious stones to realize how fine the amethysts actually were, but she thought them very beautiful, and was always pleasantly conscious of their violet shimmer at her throat, above her good brown satin dress, even though she could not see it. Anne had been smitten with delighted admiration when she first saw that brooch. Oh, Marilla, it's a perfectly elegant brooch. I don't know how you can pay attention to the sermon or the prayers when you have it on. I couldn't, I know. I think amethysts are just sweet. They are what I used to think diamonds were like. Long ago, before I'd ever seen a diamond, I read about them, and I tried to imagine what they would be like. I thought they would be lovely, glimmering purple stones. When I saw a real diamond in a lady's ring one day, I was so disappointed I cried. Of course, it was very lovely, but it wasn't my idea of a diamond. Will you let me hold the brooch for one minute, Marilla? Do you think amethysts can be the souls of good violets? End of chapter 13 Chapter 14, Anne's Confession On the Monday evening before the picnic, Marilla came down from her room with a troubled face. Anne, 
she said to that small personage, who was shelling peas by the spotless table and singing Nelly of the Hazel Dell with a vigor and expression that did credit to Diana's teaching. Did you see anything of my amethyst brooch? I thought I stuck it in my pincushion when I came home from church yesterday evening, but I can't find it anywhere. I, I saw it this afternoon when you were away at the Aid Society, said Anne a little slowly. I was passing your door when I saw it on the cushion, so I went in to look at it. "'Did you touch it?' said Marilla, sternly. "'Yes,' admitted Anne. "'I took it up and pinned it on my breast just to see how it would look.' "'You had no business to do anything of the sort. "'It is very wrong in a little girl to meddle. "'You shouldn't have gone into my room in the first place, "'and you shouldn't have touched a brooch that didn't belong to you in the second. "'Where did you put it?' "'Oh, I put it back on the bureau. "'I hadn't it on a minute.' "'Truly, I didn't mean to meddle, Marilla. "'I didn't think about it being wrong to go in and try on the brooch, "'but I see now that it was, and I'll never do it again. "'That's one good thing about me. "'I never do the same naughty thing twice.' "'You didn't put it back,' said Marilla. "'That brooch isn't anywhere on the bureau. "'You've taken it out or something, Anne.' "'I did put it back,' said Anne quickly. "'Pertly,' Marilla thought. "'I don't just remember whether I stuck it on the pincushion "'or laid it in the china tray, but I'm perfectly certain I put it back.' "'I'll go and have another look,' said Marilla, determined to be just. "'If you put that brooch back, it's there still. "'If it isn't, I'll know you didn't, that's all.' Marilla went to her room and made a thorough search, not only over the bureau, but in every other place she thought the brooch might possibly be. It was not to be found, and she returned to the kitchen. "'Anne, the brooch is gone. "'By your own admission, you were the last person to handle it. "'Now what have you done with it?' "'Tell me the truth at once. Did you take it out and lose it?' "'No, I didn't,' said Anne solemnly, meeting Marilla's angry gaze squarely. "'I never took the brooch out of your room, and that is the truth, if I was to be led to the block for it, although I'm not very certain what a block is. So there, Marilla!' Anne's so there was only intended to emphasize her assertion, but Marilla took it as a display of defiance. "'I believe you are telling me a falsehood, Anne,' she said sharply. "'I know you are. "'There now, don't say anything more unless you are prepared to tell the whole truth. "'Go to your room and stay there until you are ready to confess.' "'Will I take the peas with me?' said Anne, meekly. "'No, I'll finish shelling them myself. Do as I bid you.' When Anne had gone, Marilla went about her evening tasks in a very disturbed state of mind. She was worried about her valuable brooch. What if Anne had lost it? And how wicked of the child to deny having taken it when anybody could see she must have, with such an innocent face, too. I don't know what I wouldn't sooner have had happen, thought Marilla as she nervously shelled the peas. Of course, I don't suppose she meant to steal it or anything like that. She has just taken it to play with or help along that imagination of hers. She must have taken it, that's clear, for there hasn't been a soul in that room since she was in it by her own story till I went up tonight. And the brooch is gone, there's nothing surer. I suppose she's lost in and is afraid to own up for fear she'll be punished. It's a dreadful thing to think she tells falsehoods. It's a far worse thing than her fit of temper. It's a fearful responsibility to have a child in your house you can't trust. Slyless and untruthfulness, that's what she has displayed. I declare I feel worse about it than about the brooch. If she'd only have told the truth about it, I wouldn't mind so much. Marilla went to her room at intervals all through the evening and searched for the brooch without finding it. A bedtime visit to the East Gable produced no result. Anne persisted in denying that she knew anything about the brooch, but Marilla was only the more firmly convinced that she did. She told Matthew the story the next morning. Matthew was confounded and puzzled. He could not so quickly lose faith in Anne, but he had to admit the circumstances were against her. "'You're sure it hasn't fallen down behind the bureau?' was the only suggestion he could offer. I've moved the bureau, and I've taken out the drawers, and I've looked in every crack and cranny, was Marilla's positive answer. The brooch is gone, and that child has taken it and lied about it. That's the plain ugly truth, Matthew Cuthbert, and we might as well look it in the face. Well, now, what are you going to do about it? Matthew asked forlornly, feeling secretly thankful that Marilla and not he had to deal with the situation. He felt no desire to put his oar in this time. She'll stay in her room until she confesses said Marilla grimly, remembering the success of this method in the former case. Then we'll see. Perhaps we'll be able to find the brooch if she'll only tell where she took it. 
but in any case she'll have to be severely punished, Matthew. Well, now you'll have to punish her, said Matthew, reaching for his hat. I've nothing to do with it, remember? You warned me off yourself. Marilla felt deserted by everyone. She could not even go to Mrs. Lynde for advice. She went up to the east gable with a very serious face and left it with a face more serious still. Anne steadfastly refused to confess. She persisted in asserting that she had not taken the brooch. The child had evidently been crying, and Marilla felt a pang of pity, which she sternly repressed. By night she was, as she expressed it. Beat out. You'll stay in this room until you confess, Anne. You can make up your mind to that, she said firmly. But the picnic is tomorrow, Marilla, cried Anne. You won't keep me from going to that, will you? You'll just let me out for the afternoon, won't you? Then I'll stay here as long as you like afterwards, cheerfully. But I must go to the picnic. You'll not go to picnics nor anywhere else until you've confessed, Anne. Oh, Marilla, gasped Anne. But Marilla had gone out and shut the door. Wednesday morning dawned as bright and fair as if expressly made to order for the picnic. Birds sang around green gables. The Madonna lilies in the garden sent out whiffs of perfume that entered in on viewless winds at every door and window, and wandered through halls and rooms like spirits of benediction. The birches in the hollow waved joyful hands, as if watching for Anne's usual morning greeting from the east gable. But Anne was not at her window. When Marilla took her breakfast up to her, she found the child sitting primly on her bed, pale and resolute, with tight-shut lips and gleaming eyes. "'Marilla, I am ready to confess.' "'Ah!' Marilla laid down her tray. Once again her method had succeeded, but her success was very bitter to her. "'Let me hear what you have to say, then, Anne.' "'I took the amethyst brooch,' said Anne, as if repeating a lesson she had learned. "'I took it just as you said. I didn't mean to take it when I went in. "'But it did look so beautiful, Marilla, when I pinned it on my breast, "'that I was overcome by an irresistible temptation. "'I imagined how perfectly thrilling it would be to take it to Idlewild "'and play I was the Lady Cordelia Fitzgerald. "'It would be so much easier to imagine I was the Lady Cordelia "'if I had a real amethyst brooch on.' Diana and I make necklaces of roseberries, but what are roseberries compared to amethysts? So I took the brooch. I thought I could put it back before you came home. I went all the way around by the road to lengthen out the time. When I was going over the bridge across the Lake of Shining Waters, I took the brooch off to have another look at it. Oh, how it did shine in the sunlight! And then, when I was leaning over the bridge, it just slipped through my fingers. So, and went down, 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 all purply sparkling, and sank forevermore beneath the lake of shining waters. And that's the best I can do at confessing, Marilla. Marilla felt hot anger surge up into her heart again. This child had taken and lost her treasured amethyst brooch, and now sat there calmly reciting the details thereof without the least apparent compunction or repentance. And this is terrible she said, trying to speak calmly. "'You are the very wickedest girl I ever heard of.' "'Yes, I suppose I am,' agreed Anne tranquilly. "'And I know I'll have to be punished. "'It'll be your duty to punish me, Marilla. "'Won't you please get it over right off "'because I'd like to go to the picnic with nothing on my mind.' "'Picnic, indeed! "'You'll go to no picnic today, Anne Shirley. "'That shall be your punishment, "'and it isn't half severe enough either for what you've done.' "'Not go to the picnic!' Anne sprang to her feet and clutched Marilla's hand. "'But you promised me I might! Oh, Marilla, I must go to the picnic! That's why I confessed! Punish me any way you like with that! Oh, Marilla, please, please let me go to the picnic! Think of the ice cream! For anything you know, I may never have a chance to taste ice cream again!' Marilla disengaged Anne's clinging hands stonily. "'You needn't plead, Anne. You are not going to the picnic, and that's final. No, not a word.' Anne realized that Marilla was not to be moved. She clasped her hands together, gave a piercing shriek, and then flung herself face downward on the bed, crying and writhing in an utter abandonment of disappointment and despair. "'For land's sake!' gasped Marilla, hastening from the room. 
I believe the child is crazy. No child in her senses would behave as she does. If she isn't, she's utterly bad. Oh, dear, I'm afraid Rachel was right from the first. But I'll put my hand to the plow, and I won't look back. That was a dismal morning. Marilla worked fiercely and scrubbed the porch floor and the dairy shelves when she could find nothing else to do. Neither the shelves nor the porch needed it, but Marilla did. Then she went out and raked the yard. When dinner was ready, she went to the stairs and called Anne. A tear-stained face appeared, looking tragically over the banisters. "'Come down to your dinner, Anne.' "'I don't want any dinner, Marilla,' said Anne, sobbingly. "'I couldn't eat anything. My heart is broken. "'You'll feel remorse of conscience some day, I expect, from breaking it, Marilla. "'But I forgive you. Remember when the time comes that I forgive you. "'But please don't ask me to eat anything, especially boiled pork and greens. "'Boiled pork and greens are so unromantic when one is in an affliction.' Exasperated, Marilla turned to the kitchen and poured out her tale of woe to Matthew, who, between his sense of justice and his unlawful sympathy with Anne, was a miserable man. "'Well, now she shouldn't have taken the brooch, Marilla, or told stories about it,' he admitted, mournfully surveying his plate full of unromantic pork and greens, as if he, like Anne, thought it a food unsuited to crises of feeling. "'But she's such a little thing.' "'Such an interesting little thing. "'Don't you think it's pretty rough "'not to let her go to the picnic "'when she's so set on it? "'Matthew Cuthbert, I'm amazed at you. "'I think I've let her off entirely too easy, "'and she doesn't appear to realize "'how wicked she's been at all. "'That's what worries me most. "'If she'd really felt sorry, "'it wouldn't be so bad. "'And you don't seem to realize it neither. "'You're making excuses for her all the time to yourself. "'I can see that. "'Well, now she's such a little thing.' feebly reiterated Matthew. And there should be allowances made, Marilla. You know she's never had any bringing up. Well, she's having it now, retorted Marilla. The retort silenced Matthew, if it did not convince him. That dinner was a very dismal meal. The only cheerful thing about it was Jerry Beatt, the hired boy, and Marilla resented his cheerfulness as a personal insult. When her dishes were washed, and her bread sponge set, and her hens fed, Marilla remembered that she had noticed a small rent in her best black lace shawl when she had taken it off on Monday afternoon on returning from the ladies' aid. She would go and mend it. The shawl was in a box in her trunk. As Marilla lifted it out, the sunlight, falling through the vines that clustered thickly about the window, struck upon something caught in the shawl, something that glittered and sparkled, in facets of violet light. Marilla snatched at it with a gasp. It was the amethyst brooch, hanging to a thread of the lace by its catch. "'Dear life and heart,' said Marilla blankly, "'what does this mean? Here's my brooch, safe and sound, that I thought was at the bottom of Barry's pond. Whatever did that girl mean by saying she took it and lost it?' I declare I believe Green Gables is bewitched. I remember now that when I took off my shawl Monday afternoon, I laid it on the bureau for a minute. I suppose the brooch got caught in it somehow. Well! Marilla betook herself to the east gable, brooch in hand. Anne had cried herself out and was sitting dejectedly by the window. Anne Shirley, said Marilla solemnly, I've just found my brooch hanging to my black lace shawl. Now I want to know what that rigmarole you told me this morning meant. Why, you said you'd keep me here until I confessed, returned Anne wearily. And so I decided to confess because I was bound to get to the picnic. I thought out a confession last night after I went to bed and made it as interesting as I could. And I said it over and over so that I wouldn't forget it. "'But you wouldn't let me go to the picnic after all, so all my trouble was wasted.' Marilla had to laugh in spite of herself, but her conscience pricked her. "'Anne, you do beat all. But I was wrong. I see that now. I shouldn't have doubted your word when I've never known you to tell a story. Of course, it wasn't right for you to confess to a thing you hadn't done. It was very wrong to do so. But I drove you to it, so if you'll forgive me, Anne, I'll forgive you, and we'll start square again.' 
Now get yourself ready for the picnic. Anne flew up like a rocket. Oh, Marilla, isn't it too late? No, it's only two o'clock. They won't be more than well gathered yet, and it'll be an hour before they have tea. Wash your face and comb your hair and put on your gingham. I'll fill a basket for you. There's plenty of stuff baked in the house, and I'll get Jerry to hitch up the sorrel and drive you down to the picnic ground. Oh, Marilla, exclaimed Anne, flying to the washstand. Five minutes ago I was so miserable I was wishing I'd never been born, and now I wouldn't change places with an angel. That night, a thoroughly happy, completely tired out Anne returned to Green Gables in a state of beatification impossible to describe. Oh, Marilla, I have had a perfectly scrumptious time. Scrumptious is a new word I learned today. I heard Mary Alice Bell use it. Isn't it very expressive? Everything was lovely. We had a splendid tea, and then Mr. Harmon Andrews took us all for a row on the Lake of Shining Waters, six of us at a time. And Jane Andrews nearly fell overboard. She was leaning out to pick water lilies, and if Mr. Andrews hadn't caught her by her sash just in the nick of time, she'd have fallen in and probably been drowned. Oh, I wish it had been me. It would have been such a romantic experience to have been nearly drowned. It would be such a thrilling tale to tell. And we had the ice cream. Words fail me to describe that ice cream, Marilla. I assure you, it was sublime. That evening, Marilla told the whole story to Matthew over her stocking basket. I'm willing to own up that I made a mistake, she continued candidly, but I've learned a lesson. I have to laugh when I think of Anne's confession, although I suppose I shouldn't, for it really was a falsehood. But it doesn't seem as bad as any other would have been somehow, and anyhow, I'm responsible for it. That child is hard to understand in some respects, but I believe she'll turn out all right yet. And there's one thing certain, no house will ever be dull that she's in. End of chapter 14 Okay, going back to the beginning of of our chapters today, which is going back in time quite a bit. I am so with Anne on the the difference between putting real flowers and artificial flowers on your bonnet or your dress or whatever. I mean, I know that real flowers could stain your dress. I get that. But wow, that just seems so odd to me. I mean, I suppose if she was a complete color riot with piles of crazy blooms falling off the top of her hat, that would be a bit much. But it didn't sound like that's what she did. Ah, <sighs> them people's crazy. I'm with Anne on the whole real versus artificial flower thing. And I loved, I loved the way Lucy Maud Montgomery set up the problem of Anne confessing and Marilla's lesson from Anne's confessing. There have been times where we have talked before about the problems with asking kids questions and that if you say it in too leading a way you make them without knowing it you make them answer you in a specific way because they want to please you they want to do the right thing kids tend to be like that and marilla did kind of the same thing especially with you need to confess so that you can get punished and get it over with poor ann thinking that she's going to be able to go to have ice cream for the first time. Oh my gosh. Heartbreaking. But along with Marilla learning how not to confront Anne, the other thing that I think is really, really lovely that Lucy Maud Montgomery does here is how Marilla deals with figuring out that she was wrong. I mean, she really lit into Anne. She really, really was hard on her. And to find out that she had made the mistake has to be one of those stomach churning moments. And even harder to find the proper way to say, wow, did I blow it? And I'm so sorry. Depending on the kid, that can be a really, really hard and scary thing to do. And depending on the adult, that can be a really, really hard and scary thing to do. So I thought here in in this lovely book, we have a great demonstration of both how not to and how to respond to these kinds of situations. I also love that Anne was afraid to ask Marilla or nervous about asking Marilla to go to the ice cream social in the first place, not because it was any great shakes, you know, it was a Sunday school thing, everybody else was going, blah, 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 but because she didn't know how to cook. And therefore she knew she was going to have to ask Marilla to do the cooking for her. And that seemed, that seemed too onerous. And I just, I, I love that. What a great kid. What a mensch. 
<laughs> so, yay, Anne. And yay, Marilla. And yay, ice cream. It's awesome. And on the subject of food, I just got a voicemail from listener Leslie, who has some really interesting information on the whole turmeric thing. And I thought you might like to hear this. Here we go. Hi, Heather. It's Leslie from New Jersey, or I love luck um, on Ravelry. I know that you probably finished with the turmeric issue um, in the last episode, but I just wanted to mention that um, last year my mother was diagnosed with um, senile dementia by a neurologist who specializes in dementia and Alzheimer's, and he mentioned to my sister and I um, as preventative measures for um, the onset of these type of brain diseases that you could or you should be taking turmeric every day. That was his recommendation. He also um, recommended taking krill oil instead of fish oil. has the same omega-3s and 6s, but um, is less likely to be rancid and an ounce of dark chocolate. So all of those are excellent recommendations, and um, at least one doctor in uh, is convinced that uh, turmeric really does help these systemic inflammatory diseases. Thanks. Bye. So, yeah, anti-inflammatory. Ha-ha. And krill oil. Very interesting to find out that that goes rancid less or less quickly than fish oil. Yay. And, of course, who can be told that you have to eat dark chocolate and not be happy about it? So, on that happy note, I leave you. I hope you have a great week. I will talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>